The NFL and the world have changed quite a bit in the last hundred years. That's what we're going to talk about in just a minute. Hey, I'm Lucas Kitchen. Thanks for being along the ride with me. This is more to the story. By the way, you can subscribe to our email list, either a daily or a weekly, by going to freegrace.in. You can get those updates right in your inbox, which is pretty cool. So today we're going to talk about the NFL, but I should probably warn you that I am not an athlete. I'm sort of okay at ping pong, and I took a fencing class in college, but other than that, you wouldn't want me on your team, almost no matter what the sport is. So me talking about the NFL is a little odd, but I've been researching, and that's what I actually like. So I've been researching the genesis of the NFL today, and I found a few little interesting tidbits that I thought you might like. September 1920 was when the NFL started, and the kind of guys that populated the NFL in the beginning were really different than the guys that are in it now. So in the 20s, an offensive lineman would usually be between 5'10 and 6'2. So let's see, if I stand up real straight, I'm 5'10. So, I mean, are we saying that maybe I could have had a future or maybe it would be a past in the NFL? So they generally weighed between 185 and 200 pounds. That is a little more than me, but I mean, like, I wouldn't be completely out of place, at least my body size. One difference is that they were athletes and I'm a marshmallow, so I'm sure they'd stomp me. But nonetheless, I wouldn't be that out of place. The NFL paid players $150 per game, and most games maxed out at about 15,000 spectators. I thought that was pretty cool that uh, these guys were not doing it for the money. Now, that, that was quite a bit of money back then, but not like... A get rich millionaire kind of program it was just like a it was a job and I read one interview that these guys <clears throat> just loved to play and they thought it was cool to have a job especially since the uh, they were coming into the the Great Depression not long after that so it was a uh, it was an interesting time now there's one player in particular that has caught my attention today and I've changed his name so we don't get hung up on the details. I'm calling him Sam Tucker, but he was six foot tall and he was 190 pounds. So he, a couple of inches taller than me, a few pounds more than me, but really, you know, he was a kind of an average guy for our, uh, you know, the, for this a citizen today. He could be a, an average American now, but he was a professional football player. He played both offense and defense. He went both ways. He also played receiver. So that tells you that the game was pretty different, that you didn't have these guys that were so specialized that uh, you could, you know, you could just do a lot. He was inducted into the Professional Football's Hall of Fame years after his career. I think it was 1981 that he became a Hall of Famer. So he was really good. I mean, he was he was top of the game. He was popular. People loved him. They liked watching him play. Uh, he was he was one of the uh, he was one of the stars of the NFL at the time. So now. Uh, because I don't do well staying in actual sports, let's turn this whole thing into a sci-fi story. And here's how we do it. Let's say for a second that we have a time machine and we go back and we pick up Sam Tucker from the 1920s and we bring him to the 2020s. We do it. We do a hundred Let's make it a 102-year journey into the future. We bring him to 2022. Now, you may be thinking, why would we bring him to 2022? Well, because I want him to come and join us for the Super Bowl game that just happened, okay? And, I mean, I know, it just happened, but it's a time machine, so we'll go back to the Super Bowl game. Just chill out, you guys. So we'll go back to the 2022 Super Bowl game, and we'll get him tickets, which will require a time machine too, because we'll have to buy them far in advance. But anyway, we'll buy the Super Bowl tickets. We'll get him in because I want him to see what football has become. Now, let's assume for a second that he hasn't 
been informed anything about football, the last hundred years of football. Okay, so we take him into the stands, and first of all, he is amazed by the stadium. It's the Los Angeles Rams against the Cincinnati Bengals, of course. If you watched the Super Bowl recently, I guess you would have known that. Sam watches, and as he's looking at the field and, and just you know, amazed at the turf, by the way, that they, he's, he's asking questions like, they don't play in the mud? Well, no, they don't. They have turf. So he's amazed at that, but he's, he's, he's awestrucken when the Bengals walk out on the field. He looks at these men, these mountainous, almost mythical creatures, these, these powerful characters of, of might and muscle and and girth and strength. Guys like DJ Reader and Trey Hill and Max Sharping. They're all tall as a tree and as thick as the Mississippi. All of those guys weigh at least 330 pounds, if not more. And there's like a dozen other guys as big as them. It's amazing. And he is astounded. And he looks down the line and they're all huge. He then asks about their stats and realizes that the game is different. The opposition is so incredibly different than the teams that he played in the 1920s. Now, remember, Sam comes from the 1920s at a time when 190 pounds was a professional player. And he's looking at guys that, that quite literally weigh twice his size and have six inches on him. It's, it's incredible and it's overwhelming. And as Sam Tucker is looking down at, these, uh, at, this, at this team, he begins to think, if I, a Hall of Famer, couldn't compete against these guys, which he knows he couldn't, how could anybody? I mean, Sam knows he would be crushed by them and he's a pro, he's a Hall of Famer. So he thinks, how could anyone play against these giants? I mean, football is over. There's no way for anyone but this team to win. It's a lost cause when the opposition looks like these huge, enormous guys. So he just knows there's no hope for the home team. Now, at this point, I'm just like, let's just put a pause on the story, right? I, you probably have gathered this is like a kind of like a parable metaphor sort of a thing. So let's let's pause the metaphor for a second. And I want to I want to come out of metaphor land and I want to talk to you for a second about something that I notice. And then we're going to go back into the story in a second. So I've heard people like my age and older say things like this. This world is so much more broken than it used to be. I don't know how kids are going to make it in such darkness. I've heard other people say stuff like this. Society is so immoral, there's no hope for the next generation. I've heard people say, like, I can't imagine how young people today will stand up to the challenges and the temptations in the world. And just like Sam Tucker sitting in those stands, looking at the opposing team, people who say these things are falling into a misunderstanding. You see, they need to know, I guess I should say we need to know, that the game has changed. Yes, the opposition is much, much more difficult. But the misunderstanding is thinking that if I couldn't face this opposition, that no one could. You see, people who say these things recognize that they themselves were not equipped for the world that is on its way. But just because you're not equipped for what's to come, does that mean that no one is? Well, let's go back to our story and see if we can learn something from our odd little football parable metaphor. So, we're back in the stands. We're with Sam Tucker. We're at the 2022 Super Bowl watching the Cincinnati Bengals. They're down there on the field. They're amazingly huge. Sam is overawed by them, and he's thinking there's no hope for whoever has to play these guys. He feels sorry for whoever the opposing team is, whoever the home team is. But then the Rams come out. They walk onto the field, and it's as if the gravity of the earth shudders, and Sam is once again stunned to his core. These guys are enormous as well. They've got guys like Joe Noteboom, Sean Robinson, 
and Rob Havenstein, who himself is six foot eight, 330 pounds. And there's a whole line of guys that are 300 pounds plus. He looks at the quarterback. He finds out that his stats are amazing. He's had nine solid years of experience in the pros. He's sharp. He's good on his feet. He can fire a ball from LA to New York and hit a receiver under tight coverage. I mean, the Rams are absolutely matched to the challenge and they're ready for a fight. And so Sam begins to realize that not just the opposition has changed, but so too has the home team. They've increased on both sides, and that is how the game has truly changed. So, they've been equipped. They're ready to fight, and he watches as the Rams take the game at a 23-20 win over the Bengals. Did you watch the Super Bowl, by the way? I didn't catch it this year, but apparently that's what happened. Way to go, Rams. So his lesson is really in a way parallel to the lesson that I think we need to understand about what's going on in our world. So just because pro Hall of Famer Sam Tucker wouldn't be equipped to play against the 2022 Bengals doesn't mean that there's no one who can. And in fact, the 2022 Rams did and they did well. In the same way, just because I or you are not equipped for the generation that is on its way, does that mean that nobody will be equipped for it? That is a certain kind of pride to think that just because I can't handle what's coming, that my kids won't be able to handle it as well. And in fact, that would be a fallacy of history. You see, the opposition in the world is tough, no doubt about it, but our children are being equipped to face the temptations and challenges that the world has ready in the same way that we were when we were kids. Yes, it's dark and immoral and frightening, but God is committed to his kingdom coming plan. And he won't let the light go out on the next generation. Our grandparents were not equipped for the generations that followed their times. They were equipped for their own only. It's no surprise that when they saw the gathering clouds over the generations that were to come, they made the mistake of thinking that their children were like them, unequipped to face that storm. But their children weren't unequipped, were they? They were ready. They were prepared. They were equipped. But then when our parents begin to see the dusk gathering over the horizon in a coming generation that had a different def definition of morality, a different definition of what it meant to be a Christian, it was easy for them to believe that their children would not be equipped for that generation that had not yet come, but they could see it on the horizon. But they were wrong about that too, weren't they? Because we were equipped. And here we are, now adults, doing the same thing with our kids. And now as we watch the dark of night approaching, it's easy to believe that our children won't be prepared for the darkness. But we better not make that mistake. The opposition is strong, but so too are God's forward-marching children who face the darkness. They were equipped to challenge. They will face the opposition in ways that we do not yet understand. Any more than the Apostle Paul had no idea that the gospel would someday be shared on YouTube. There was a time in biblical history that was really, really bleak. It was a time when God's people were facing a genocide. It's in the book of Esther. But God didn't leave his people without a plan of rescue. He allowed a Jewish girl to be placed in a position of royalty. He allowed her to be equipped to understand the royal court and the rules that came along with it. He allowed her to be trained in the way that she would need to face this challenge of genocide. And all of this was happening without her knowing it until the day came. And when the genocide of the Jews looked certain, this is what was spoken to her. You have been chosen to be the queen for such a time as this. 
You see, the opposition that our children face is so incredibly powerful. But they were chosen for such a time as this. God chose our children for this coming generation. He didn't choose us. He didn't choose our parents. He didn't choose our grandparents. He chose our children in the same way that he expected us to affect the world that we live in. He expects them to affect the coming world. So my goal is not to protect my children from the darkness in the world. My goal is to prepare them to bring light to that dark world. You see, millions of people are being dragged into the darkness through the portal of the internet. It happens every day. People become addicted to things they never have heard of. They fall into the rabbit hole and they are shrouded in shadow. The opposition is great, but remember the game has changed. A single young person can share the gospel with millions with only a cell phone camera and a little courage. A single young person can get the word out about God's grace in ways that the world has never seen or even conceived of before. The game has changed. The opposition has changed, but so has the coming generation and God is preparing them to fight the battle, a battle that we don't even yet understand. So although we have not been equipped to face the generations that will follow, we have been equipped to prepare those who will, our children. Don't hide your children from the darkness. Teach them to bring light into the pitch black they face. Don't doubt the next generation. Invest in it. Don't denigrate those children of God that are going to face those shadows. Equip them. Show them what it means to bring light to this present dark world. And then they're going to go forward and make us proud when we no longer walk among the shadows of this broken place. The game has changed.